2019 marks the fourth year that we've been putting together the Brainwaves podcast, and it really has been an incredible year. We've revamped the recording studio, we've talked with some incredible guests, and it's shown. To date, there have been more than 400,000 downloads of our episodes, with our recent shows being played more than 3,000 times in the week or two after they're released. I've given several Grand Rounds presentations on how the digital revolution is reshaping medical education, and it's really been incredible to run into people at work or talk to medical students on rounds or have residency applicants come up to me and say, hey, are you the Jim Siegler who does brainwaves? I'm totally nerding out about this right now, but it really is incredible. And we couldn't have done it without your support out there as listeners to the show. Thank you all for making it happen, motivating me to produce newer and more exciting content, and thank you for spreading the word about what we're doing on the show. This week on Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine and all the fascinating science and history that come with it, we're taking the time to reflect back on some of the most interesting and the most popular shows of 2019. I'm your host, Jim Siegler. Don't go anywhere. My wife, Eric, and I were driving back from a vacation we took down in Arkansas, my home state. It was close to Halloween at the time. On the radio, the host was speculating about what she thought that a zombie apocalypse might be like, who you'd rely on to help you through it. According to her reporting, 77% of Americans said that they would arm themselves to fight off the zombies. 77%. But not her. Nope, she would play the medic that you might rely on to treat your wounds, give you Tylenol for pain and to keep your mind sharp with multivitamins, ginkgo biloba, ginseng. It reminded me of the show that we produced on brain food, about the kinds of foods and nutritional supplements that you might take which could offset dementia. Now, these foods aren't exactly a prophylactic for zombieism, but some of them may have a role in reducing the risk of memory loss. Just not the ginkgo biloba, ginseng, and multivitamin complex that she was talking about. So, in the first part of our program today, I thought we'd go back to that earlier show, revisit the foods that have some sort of evidence to improve brain health. Growing up and in health class, we're always taught that, you know, what we eat is who we are and really affects our health. That's what we're taught growing up. You are what you eat. From the plaques that are in our arteries right, to the sugar levels in our bodies and how much adipose tissue we have, all that affects in the long run how long we live and how well we live. And that all makes sense, right? You get out whatever it is that you put in. If you look at the epidemiologic data in the neurology literature, as many as one in three cases of Alzheimer's disease can be attributed to modifiable factors. Diet's a major one of these. And while the brain only takes up 2% of your total body weight, it consumes 20% of the energy that you put in. So this week on the podcast, we'll be dividing up the program into three parts, each tackling a different aspect of nutrition and cognitive function. The question is, how much of our brain health boils down to what we eat or drink? And despite how mixed the literature is to nutritionists and neurologists, I wanted to see what other people thought. So I asked my family about it. I think diet is very important. Erica, my wife. I don't believe that processed foods or preserved foods are good for brain health. My Aunt Ellen. I do feel that I should have protein, good protein. Grandmother Joan. And also my father, Rocky, whose diet, like Ellen's, emphasizes the natural foods. Nothing processed. Your vegetables that are ground above ground. Throughout the show, we will be comparing what they think and what they've heard with what's actually out there, the scientific data. And by the end of the show, I hope you'll have a better understanding of which food groups, vitamins, and nutrients may play a role in brain health, and which foods, if any, can reduce the risk of cognitive impairment, and maybe even dementia. I don't know which ones might be for dementia. I don't know which, which ones might be for that. That's what I'd like to learn. Part 1. You're missing out. In medical school, we're taught that deficiencies of key vitamins, nutrients, protein, fats, carbohydrates, this can all lead to various states of malnutrition, Kwashiorkor being perhaps the most infamous state of malnutrition in global health. This is a condition that's endemic to poverty-stricken societies, 
and it's the result of an extended reduction of protein in the diet. Too much rice or bread and not enough meat or vegetables. Or you can imagine another state of malnutrition, a diet that's entirely deficient in fats. But sometimes, we as neurologists will intentionally augment a patient's diet in a way that borders on the extreme. I'm sure that you've heard of the ketogenic diet. The ketogenic diet is a high-fat, low-carb eating plan. Um, right now, the ketogenic diet, a lot of hashtag keto out there. This, this really is nothing new. This is the concept. Dramatically increasing the proportion of calories obtained through fats and reducing the calories obtained through carbohydrates. Every day. So first of all, I start off my morning with coffee. Everybody likes coffee, but I'll add coconut oil and butter, blend it up, it tastes delicious. It's actually really filling. That actually sounds kind of revolting. Okay, and then dinner. And the dinner, bacon cheeseburger. No, bacon. Enough said. Now we're talking. <laughs> and by adhering to this diet, by reaching ketosis, or by emulsifying your blood with fatty acids, almost to the point of changing the color of your blood from red to a kind of an orange, Patients with refractory epilepsy are achieving a far greater control of their seizures, and some even seizure freedom. Next, let's move on to the B vitamins and cognitive function. But to answer this question, we have to talk about homocysteine, an amino acid. The health implications of homocysteine are spreading throughout the mainstream medical and social media, and you can find various blog posts and commentaries about this amino acid. Elevated levels of it are shown to be increasingly associated with cardiovascular disease and stroke. Basically, the high Epidemiologic studies have found that moderate elevations in homocysteine, even when it's still in the normal range, have correlated with cardiovascular events and dementia in elderly patients. But whether or not you should be checking this as part of routine care, it's still kind of unclear. And most physicians won't do this. Anyway. Homocysteine is an essential protein building block, and the body's natural mechanism for ridding excess homocysteine is through two pathways. One uses folate and vitamin B12, and the other uses B6, or niacin. B6 we get from our nuts and our grains, and B12 from dairy products and meats. To date, there have been more than a dozen studies evaluating the cognitive benefits of B vitamins and folate supplementation, and you may have guessed it, the evidence is still pretty lacking. Most observational studies show zero effect, while a few showed some benefit and a few showed some harm. Four clinical trials have been conducted that I'm aware of, and three were negative in their primary endpoints. One could say that publication bias may have contributed to the over-reporting of positive findings, but ultimately we are left to conclude that the B vitamin supplements seem neither to help nor to hurt when used in moderation. Now, folate is a different story. Folate, when given to patients with high homocysteine levels, or patients who have low vitamin B12 levels, it's been shown to improve cognitive function to some degree, either processing speed or memory retention. In one of the two major trials which demonstrated this benefit, folate was given in addition to a complex of B vitamins, so perhaps this effect could have been mediated by other supplements. Another group of supplements to consider here are antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, and carotenoids in particular. We discussed these a bit in the prior episode on chasing the dragon, as it's currently thought that heroin inhalation leukoencephalopathy may be in part kind of mediated by oxidative damage, and this could be mitigated by antioxidants like vitamin E and CoQ10. Overall, when we think about how the brain is susceptible to oxidative damage, it's highly metabolically active, and oxidative injury has been implicated in some dementias. So maybe by preventing oxidative damage, that could be a good thing for the brain. Sadly, unlike the B vitamins, which have been studied in several clinical trials, there are very few randomized studies evaluating the cognitive benefits of antioxidants. And the observational evidence is also pretty weak. Luckily, these singular nutrients are found in otherwise what we would consider healthy foods. Citrus fruits and vegetables are rich in vitamin C, vitamin E we find in fish, it's also in egg yolk and whole grains, and carotenoids are found in practically anything that grows out of the ground and looks orange-ish. And let me just say that while I'm not trying to give anybody any advice about their nutrition, it seems reasonable to have a lean piece of fish every now and then, rather than going to Whole Foods and buying yourself a jar of vitamin E. And my Aunt Ellen has the same philosophy. I would rather eat my vitamins than take a pill. Now, what about the other building blocks, 
proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Unfortunately, there are even less data to guide decision-making here. The jury's still out for cognitive outcomes in patients who take a high-carb diet, although I'm not seeing any MDs recommending this. It's probably not healthy for you anyways because it can lead to diabetes and obesity, kidney disease, heart attacks, you name it. A diet high in protein, however, something like the Atkins diet, can facilitate weight loss, probably because you'd be consuming more calories from the protein rather than from fats or carbs, which can later become fats. And then instead of having more carbohydrates available, the thought is that your body would need to use its fat stores for fuel. Makes sense to me. But there's no evidence that a high-protein diet improves cognitive performance or can reduce the risk of dementia. We'll get into some of the nuanced high-protein diets in a minute. A diet low in fats, however, particularly saturated fats, is promoted nearly universally by medical professionals. It's an integral component of the Atkins diet, and the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, and the MIND diet. And as an aside here, in case you've never come across these different meal plans, the Mediterranean diet is a largely plant-based diet. Vegetables and fish. Rich in fruits, vegetables, grains, lean protein. With a protein that usually is eggs or beans. Nuts and fermented dairy. And lots of olive oil. Instead of using butter and vegetable oil, we should be using olive oil. The DASH diet is similar, but it encourages low-fat dairy products and limits the sodium intake. It's more designed to lower blood pressure. And the MIND diet, M-I-N-D, is a hybrid of the Mediterranean and the DASH diets that avoids processed sugars and saturated fats or butter. Low saturated fat is part of all these diets. But all this being said, the brain's mostly fat, right? So isn't some fat a good thing? Well, I'm glad you asked. And the answer is yeah. Probably. Oh yeah, I think you have to have fats. I do. I do think you should. When we think about fats and neuroprotection, We're mostly talking about the N3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega fatty acids, fats that we find mostly in fish and vegetable or olive oil. And there are a number of observational studies and two randomized clinical trials that have demonstrated that there are favorable cognitive outcomes to be seen in patients with a high intake of N3 fatty acids, reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease, lower risk of dementia of any cause, and a slower rate of cognitive decline. Nuts and olive oil too which are both rich in these particular fats, have been proven in clinical trials to improve some sort of cognitive outcomes. And again, these are still your polyunsaturated fats. Saturated fats, like we see in bacon and cheese, delicious foods, these have been linked to a higher rate of dementia and more rapid cognitive decline in a handful of studies. Some studies have found no relationship, but there's clearly no benefit for a diet that's supplemented with saturated fats. Next, let's move on to a food group that's even more complicated, alcohol. You know, it's funny about drinking, too. I mean, wine has been associated with improved health outcomes. Specifically red wine. I've always heard that perhaps red wine, you know, a a moderate amount in the evenings would be good. Uh The importance here being moderation. But only in moderation. According to one meta-analysis from 2017, a moderate amount of alcohol consumption something less than a glass of wine or a can of beer per day, has been shown to reduce the risk of dementia from any cause. Any more than that, and the dementia risk increases. However, not everyone believes this data. I think all alcohol is bad for brain growth. But some nights, sure, maybe it's not that bad for you. But I've heard that that's also good for you, that, you know, a glass of wine once in a while isn't a bad thing, so... At least that's probably what you've heard on the news for reducing your risk of cancer and heart disease. When drunk in moderation as part of the Mediterranean diet, red wine accompanies nutrient-rich foods like fruits, vegetables, fish, and nuts. And the evidence suggests that it's the diet taken as a whole that leads to a longer, healthier life. And I associate it more with heart health than brain health. So yeah, what about the brain? I can't say that I've heard about it being specific for the brain. Wine's effect on the brain hasn't received as much attention in the social media as wine's effect on your risk of heart disease. But some groups have picked it up. But new research says wine gives your brain a real workout. In particular, red wines. About this new study showing that red wine could help people with Alzheimer's. It seems that there is one particular compound that's found in the grapes of red wine that's been linked to better cognitive outcomes. And you may have come across it. Resveratrol. 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 
It's an antioxidant and a strong one. It, is it happens to be one of the polyphenols that's found in the skin of grapes, and it's also in chocolate and blueberries and a few other food groups. And it's this compound which we think is most associated with the health benefits of drinking red wine. But what are the cognitive benefits? The mouse literature, for what it's worth, has shown that resveratrol absolutely can improve one's performance on cognitive tasks. Better memory, quicker spatial processing, but the human literature is a whole other ballgame. In one of the only randomized human clinical trials, published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, people who were randomized to resveratrol had greater cerebral blood flow with greater oxygen extraction, but the investigators couldn't prove that there was any functional benefit. Cognitive outcomes were the same between the treatment group and the placebo controls. Identical results were seen in a subsequent randomized placebo-controlled trial. Resveratrol augments blood flow, but not neurologic function, so no magical pill yet. However, when looking at the non-randomized, long-term human data, there may be a signal there. A French group published their experience in the premier journal Neurology, identifying a 50% reduction in 12-year risk of dementia among patients who ingested more polyphenols compared to those who didn't. And this 50% cut adjusted for the other confounding variables, which could also have contributed to dementia. Granted, this study had a number of methodological limitations. It was non-randomized, and polyphenol intake was not the only factor associated with lower dementia risk. And patients in the study also took in a diet that was rich in plant products and tea. Curious, nonetheless. And while other data are either inconclusive or they're preliminary, I think we can still be optimistic about the future of several of these plant-based compounds. But that doesn't mean you need to go home and start drinking wine every night. Another important beverage to think about would be coffee. Half-calf brown bear. Coffee can be bad for you, but it can also be good for you in certain situations. Americano. I think it would help. I mean, I'm a big coffee drinker. Honey vanilla chai. I've already talked at length about the pros and the cons of caffeine in episode 57, and you can check that out later. Caffeine as a stimulant can certainly heighten your awareness and perhaps improve your cognitive function and performance for a short period of time. But does it reduce the risk of long-term cognitive decline, or does it stave off dementia? I haven't heard or learned of it being associated with preservation of brain function. Eric and I will have a cup of coffee practically every day. And while I'm sad to say that, unlike alcohol, which is probably best in moderation, coffee may be best when used closer to excess. According to a 2016 meta-analysis of 11 prospective observational studies, moderate coffee consumption was not associated with the lower risk of cognitive decline or dementia. Instead, the authors found that patients who drank a significant amount of coffee, more than a couple of cups a day, were at a 27% lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Now it gets a little more complicated because a subsequent meta-analysis of prospective data that was published two years later, this study failed to replicate these findings. And there appears to be no dose response either. So drinking two cups rather than one or three cups rather than two doesn't seem to help. And this argues against a physiologic explanation. Where there does seem to be a potential benefit for coffee consumption is in the Parkinson disease literature. A moderate amount of coffee may stave off Parkinson disease. And furthermore, in patients who have PD, it may improve the non-motor symptoms and reduce the risk of PD-associated dementia. So that's kind of exciting for all you coffee drinkers out there. The effect may be driven by caffeine, as at least one study I came across has shown, but there are other relationships to consider. These are just far more complex for a single show, like discussing the microbiology of your digestive system, the hydrogen sulfide content in the coffee, there's some compound called quercetin. In any case, whatever it is, coffee doesn't seem to hurt. And maybe it helps. Part 2. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. So now let's take a step back from the micronutrients and the carbs and the fats, and let's think bigger picture. What food groups and diets out there can promote brain health, or at least improve cognitive performance? I asked my family this question. One decade, a certain food is good for you, and next decade, it seems like it's not. I do eat nuts every day, because I've always been told they were good for you. Your nuts. I've read about omega-3s. I know omega-3 fatty acids are really important. Your berries. Now, maybe this is a myth. Your fruits. 
I think the hormones are bad. And your vegetables that are grown above ground, not your vegetables that are grown underground. You know, I don't know. So lots of thoughts out there. But I think the best evidence for diets that promote brain health comes from studies on the Mediterranean diet. Now let's talk about the evidence. In 2015, a group of Spanish trialists published one of the most robustly designed randomized clinical trials in JAMA Internal Medicine. It was a relatively small trial, 447 cognitively intact and healthy volunteers were randomized to one of three diets for a four-year period. A Mediterranean diet that was rich in olive oil, impressively being about one liter per week, a Mediterranean diet that was rich in nuts, or generally a low-fat diet. When the investigators compared patients in the low-fat, control diet, to the patients in either of the Mediterranean diet arms, the patients who were in the Mediterranean diets did significantly better on cognitive tasks, and they even performed better at follow-up than they did at baseline, showing improvement. Another randomized trial showed similar results. In this study, the Predimed Navarra trial, which also includes Spanish patients, the patients randomized to a Mediterranean diet with olive oil or nuts versus a low-fat diet also performed better on many mental status examinations, and clock drawing after six years of follow-up. And there's additional observational evidence to support the relationship between cognitive performance and a diet that's rich in vegetables and olive oil, and low in red meats and carbohydrates. So go Mediterranean diet. Now this is all well and good, but when you break it down, there have only been five randomized clinical trials evaluating the risk of cognitive decline among patients who adhere to a Mediterranean diet. Most of them are generally positive or neutral with their cognitive endpoints. But out of these five trials have emerged more than a dozen different systematic reviews. We've referenced some of them in the show notes. But what I'm taking away from all this data is that the design of each trial was extremely different. The diets varied considerably between the trials, and probably between individuals in each trial. And most trials assessed very unique cognitive endpoints. So it's practically impossible to combine patient-level data into a single meta-analysis. Moving up from the Mediterranean diet is the MIND diet, which I've already said is the Mediterranean DASH diet intervention for neurodegenerative delay, the diet that combines Mediterranean-based principles, olive oil, fruits, vegetables, and a lean meat strategy with a diet that's lower in sodium and higher in potassium, better for blood pressure control. This diet, the MIND diet, was designed to improve cognitive performance. It was based on the notion that fruits like oranges and berries should be added to a diet that's high in N3 fatty acids and vegetables, which have all on some level been associated with improved cognitive outcomes. Other diets have also hopped on board this plant-based diet train. The Prudent Diet and the Baltic Sea Diet are both highly similar to the plant, legume, and olive oil-based Mediterranean diet. And each of these diets have been shown in observational studies to reduce the risk of dementia and to improve cognitive performance. Now let's be even more aggressive with our fatty acids. You've heard of the ketogenic diet, right? Face it, keto is everywhere. Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube. It's everywhere. The miracle diet that's accelerating weight loss and saving countless children with drug-resistant epilepsy. And it works for many of these kids, it really does. Achieving ketosis is considered healthy for the brain. So it makes you wonder, could a ketogenic diet be helpful for other neurologic diseases? Well, we know that on a biological level, ketosis can reduce central nervous system inflammation. We know it can improve the mitochondrial health and cortical neurons, and it can prevent neuronal death. So it begs the question, can this kind of diet reduce somebody's risk of cognitive impairment, or even dementia? One study that was published in Cell Metabolism looked at older mice who were fed a ketogenic diet, and it compared them to mice who were fed a diet with the standard amount of carbohydrates. Not only did the treatment mice live longer, but they also outperformed their carb-crunching comrades in a diverse variety of memory and cognitive tasks, place avoidance, object recognition, maze mapping, all better with that keto diet. But mice aren't humans. The human nervous system is far more complex, and the human diet is far more diverse and exciting than mouse kibble. So would we see the same effects in humans exposed to a ketogenic diet? Thus far, the evidence is lacking in this regard, But research is ongoing, and it's a very exciting time to study this type of question. Preliminary results from at least one small study have shown that a ketogenic diet can improve working memory, visual attention, and task switching in non-demented elderly patients. 
but let's keep a look at for future randomized trial data before we come to any conclusions. In addition to these better known diets, new diets are being crafted all the time with the goal of improving brain function. A new age diet, which is a personally tailored and frequently adjusted brain healthy diet, is one that was published in a randomized clinical trial back in 2018. It seemed to work at improving global cognitive performance and episodic memory after one year of implementation. The Bridge Diet is a Mediterranean plus weight loss based diet, and one trial is prospectively studying that right now. Then there's also the Paleo Diet, the Atkins Diet, the Zone Diet, Lemon Detox, Cabbage Soup, South Beach, Weight Watch. There are just too many to keep track of. And to be honest, not much data that any of these other fad diets are good for brain health. Part 3. Everything with a grain of salt. So it's been about 20 minutes. Let's summarize what we've covered so far. Homocysteine, whose levels correlate with cardiovascular disease and risk of dementia, it's unclear if trying to reduce the level of this amino acid may reduce the later risk of dementia. It may just be a biomarker. Vitamin B6 and B12, no clear association with cognitive function when supplemented. However, we do know that B12 deficiency, which is seen predominantly in vegans and gastric bypass patients and extremely malnourished patients, this does create a reversible dementia picture. And maybe you might consider a B vitamin complex for your patients with elevated homocysteine levels or vascular disease, as there's a weak body of evidence to support that. Antioxidants, as micronutrients, probably not worth anybody's time or money. But maybe a little more olive oil or some polyunsaturated fatty acids could be a part of your future diet. Or wine and coffee, when used in moderation. These may also be beneficial but the jury is out for most of these associations. A Mediterranean-style diet is probably the closest that we've come to identifying the optimal brain food, but the cognitive benefits are subtle, and they're contingent on a number of factors which are really difficult to control, like drinking a liter of olive oil each week. And I'm cautiously optimistic about the ketogenic diet, which is truly amazing in patients who have refractory epilepsy, but putting all those fats and red meats into your body it just seems unhealthy, doesn't it? What does your gut tell you about that? At this point, I've done as much as I can to summarize the available high-quality literature out there on the subject, but let me confess something. I've painted a very biased picture for you. I wouldn't go as far as to say that what I've said is fake news, but it's on that spectrum of bias. The fact of the matter is, all I can tell you is as much as there really has been published in peer-reviewed literature. And there's a ton of limitations to what we know and what we don't know about nutrition and cognitive function. Think about it this way. You love blueberries. Like, you really love blueberries. And you want to prove that eating blueberries is good for preventing dementia. So you conduct a randomized controlled trial of eating one cup of blueberries a day for five years versus no blueberries. And you found that the rate of Alzheimer's disease was the same. Who do you think is going to want to publish that data? Nobody, right? But let's say you took your blueberry data, you crunched all those numbers every which way you could, and you repeated the study in a population of patients at a high risk of dementia. And now all of a sudden, you found that eating about one cup of blueberries per day can improve somebody's performance on a cognitive task. You can make a physiologic story out of that and publish it. And turns out someone actually did that, showing that blueberry enhanced diets were associated with higher scores on the California Verbal Learning Test after 90 days. So there's a decent amount of publication bias out there. And then we've got selection bias, which we've covered before in episode 122 with Ali Hamadani. Selection bias is a major problem in these nutrition studies because presumably healthier, more cooperative, and probably more affluent patients would be more likely to participate in these observational studies. Then you've got attrition bias, or limitations due to follow-up. Maybe the patients who hated your blueberry study said, to hell with this. I got stuck in the arm with no blueberries. Blueberries have to be good for me, so I'm just going to drop out. And they say this because they're clever. They figured out what you're trying to do. But the less clever patients in the study may not think about it that way. Maybe they'll think, huh, no blueberries. I can do this. And now you're left with dumber people in the arm that's not getting blueberries. Then there's also this problem with recall bias. Most of the data that we've discussed today comes from observational cohorts, not randomized controlled trials. If your patient reports that she was eating pomegranate seeds once a week for the last four years, how many pomegranate seeds are enough pomegranate seeds? I've heard pomegranate's really good for you. And is it the pomegranate seeds or is it the vitamin C? 
I have pomegranate and cranberry every morning. Or is it something else in the pomegranate seeds that we just don't even know about? This is a problem endemic to most nutritional studies. Food groups are not eaten in isolation. We're having coffee or tea, wine or chocolate, steak and seafood. And there's simply no way to adjust for all the interactions between each of these food groups, some of which can be good, like wine in moderation, and some of which could be bad, probably like red meats. So many of these variables cannot be accounted for, and it leaves us with just as many questions as we've tried to answer. And my father, who has almost no interest in medicine, even he's been able to pick up on the limitations of why we might find an association between certain diets and health benefits. I definitely believe that the diet and the liquor has to do with your economic position. Whereas yeah. if you're poor, uh, uh, the likelihood of you really eating like you're supposed to eat if you're poor yeah. is probably not very good. And so when you do your tests and your surveys on uh, on that stuff, it's uh, it's all based on economics. And then I'm curious to know, when is it important to focus on dietary modifications to prevent cognitive decline? Deep down, I get the feeling that earlier is probably better than later. Take the results of the MAP trial, for example. In this multi-center randomized placebo-controlled trial, patients who were given N3 omega fatty acid supplementation did no better than patients who were randomized to placebo. But this trial enrolled patients who already had some mild cognitive impairment. So maybe it was too late to help them. I mean, who knows, right? If the trialists had enrolled higher risk but cognitively normal patients, middle-aged patients who had ApoE4 alleles, for example, maybe the omega fatty acid supplementation could have helped a little bit. There's just no way to tell. What I've taken away from this talk today is that it's not going to be just one thing that keeps you from developing Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment. There's no magical pill. You've got to take everything I've said with a grain of salt. If you consider trials like PrediMed Navara, you might think that drinking one liter of extra virgin olive oil each week is good for you. And I don't know, maybe it is. But for now, there's no singular nutrient, no pill or fashionable diet that's perfect for your brain health. There's no black or white information or rules or guidelines. These are all just suggestions. I think you've got to consider all things in moderation. I do feel like a well-balanced diet is good for dementia. All things in moderation, including moderation. If you want a McDonald's double quarter pounder with cheese, have a McDonald's double quarter pounder with cheese. One of them probably won't kill you. But we've all got common sense, and it doesn't take a medical degree to realize what a healthy diet is. I think diet is very important. Every morning I take one multivitamin. Pure yogurt and vegetables and fish. I don't eat a lot of meat. No breakfast. Yogurt with some fruit and almonds. No lunch. And then I take krill instead of uh, fish oil. I try to avoid red meat. Uh, A little hamburger meat. That's also just a taste preference. I would say I'm probably closest to Mediterranean. But I tell you what, I don't take butter anymore. Especially with the fish and olive oil, I'm, I'm definitely in that group. My preference will always be grilled cheese, but I can't have that every day. It would be an understatement to say that having a child transforms your life. (laughs) Not just in the sense that I'm trying to eat healthier to serve as a better role model for Sophia, and not just in the sense that everything that you do revolves around their schedule. Want to go to the gym? Not today. Heading out the door? Wait, we need a diaper change. Date night? Think again. It's also that I'm vigilantly attuned to everything in my environment. Dogs unrestrained by leashes, smokers, bad drivers on the road, and then the behaviors of other parents. Now, I'm not going to go as far as saying that some of their behaviors are bad, or that these parents do not have their kids' best interests in mind. But when I come across any story about a mother or a father who refuses to vaccinate their child because they believe that vaccines cause autism or seizures or bowel disease or whatever it is, it absolutely blows my mind. 
As the measles epidemic in the U.S. grew throughout 2019, I made it a point to summarize the evidence regarding the safety and the efficacy of MMR vaccines in children. And since the original release of that podcast, more than 1,200 cases of measles have been identified in the U.S. with 22 different sites of outbreak. And hopefully, through this podcast and through other mechanisms, we can get more accurate information out there, make it accessible to families with questions or concerns. So, in part two of our program, Measles and Vaccines. In the mid-90s, a young surgeon in the UK was approached by a woman by the name of Rosemary Keswick, whose son had begun to suffer from inflammatory bowel disease. The boy had also recently begun to regress with his developmental milestones. The surgeon sought out by the mother was a specialist in gut and liver transplantation and was a senior lecturer at the Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine, London, an up-and-coming junior faculty member. He took on the case of Rosemary Keswick's son and began to investigate why it was that the child would develop both cerebral and gastrointestinal dysfunction simultaneously. On review systems, the surgeon discovered that the child had been healthy up until the time of his first measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, the MMR. He found this rather curious and considered whether other patients had a similar experience. Through a network of colleagues, he was ultimately approached by other families whose children also suffered from autism, eight of whom had received the same series of vaccines. Ultimately, the surgeon was hired by several lawyers in order to bring the vaccination companies to justice. In 1998, he wrote up his findings and published them in Lancet as a case series. Only there were a few problems, and we have the incredible research by one Brian Deere to thank for this. First, the case series was reported as a consecutive enrollment of patients, when in fact these patients were selectively identified by the investigators through the MMR campaign group, whose purpose was entirely to discredit vaccinations. One patient was even flown in from the U.S. to be seen by that doctor who would blame autism on the MMR. Hardly a random selection of patients who showed up to their hospital. Second, the surgeon failed to acknowledge relevant financial disclosures. At the time, he was contracted for hundreds of thousands of British pounds to discredit the vaccine companies. In addition, he had submitted his own patent for an independent measles vaccine, which only could have profited off the defamation of the MMR. So, a couple of conflicts of interest there. Third, he made up data. Independent review of the included patient's medical records led to the discovery that some kids weren't even autistic to begin with and some had autistic features that predated the MMR. After reviewing the GI histology, none of the kids had colitis either. Most were just constipated. Of the 12 patients in this original cohort, not a single case was free of falsified data. And in spite of this horrifying scandal of medical inquiry, these allegations remain critical components of an anti-vaccination movement that is harming children and families by the thousands. Hi, podcast listeners. Jim Siegler here for Brainwaves, a podcast about neurology and medicine and all the fascinating science and history that come with it. It's been 21 years since the original publication of Andrew Wakefield's falsified manuscript linking the MMR vaccine to autism. And for all the children who were born to parents that did not give in to this impressive and shocking medical lie, now those children have grown up. They're old enough to vote, old enough to fight in the military, old enough to enjoy a beer, and they're getting to that age where they might too have their own kids. But for others, well, they haven't been so lucky. This week on the program, we'll be talking about this anti-vax movement, the clinical data, the controversies in the media, and the perspective of the pediatrician. It's not that vaccines are without risk. All medical interventions run the possibility of causing an adverse reaction. At the end of the program, I'd love to get your thoughts on all of this. So pull out your phone, find me on Twitter at Brainwaves Audio or Facebook at facebook.com slash Brainwaves Audio and start up a conversation. Let's keep this important dialogue open and bring all the facts to light. For the listeners out there who may remember some of the older episodes of the show, you may recognize Erica Mejia. Hi. Erica, my lovely wife, is a pediatrician here in Philadelphia. Hi, my name's Erica Mejia. I'm a board certified pediatrician. And she was kind enough to share her own opinions on the risks and the benefits of vaccines for the show. And I'm currently a pediatric cardiology fellow. Her opinion on this matter is obviously more important than mine. 
So I wanted to make sure that you all heard more than just my own perspective on vaccines, also hers, as she gets this question all the time. Even though I'm a pediatric cardiology fellow, vaccine still comes up in many of my patients. Um, or for, it was a concern for many families, especially because a lot of the patients I see, they're newborns and we follow them throughout the course of their lives. And we have had a few families come in um, e- expressing that they have elected to not vaccinate their children. And when we ask them why, Some of them have expressed concerns that vaccines can cause autism or that they're concerned about the components of the the vaccine, that there may be mercury, and then that in and of itself can cause harm to the infant. Would you say it's a common problem that people bring up? No, I wouldn't say it's a common problem. It's... Most of the patients that we see and most of the families that we see elect to vaccinate their children. There are a few cases where the child, due to an immune compromise status or due to an evaluation, their vaccine schedule is just delayed or prolonged. But every now and then we do have families that do come in with that concern. In organizing this week's program, I put together a couple of statements that I've come across on social media with the hope that we can illuminate the truth, or at least dispel any myths or misunderstandings about vaccines. Here we go. Fact or fiction. Measles is a preventable viral illness which otherwise can cause fevers, rash, pneumonia, paralysis, or even death. So we're starting off with a softball here, but it's important to set the stage. This one is a fact. Something that is completely, utterly preventable. Often with measles, patients feel flu-like symptoms. They can develop a whole body rash, and a week later, they survive the illness. However, the fact of the matter is, more than 100,000 people die every year because of measles. The perceived mildness of the symptoms is one of the most common reasons that parents choose not to vaccinate their kids. The worry is that, especially with younger kids who can't mount a successful immune response to the virus, same goes for the elderly and the immunocompromised, measles could be life-threatening. According to the CDC, approximately one in five persons in the U.S. who were infected with measles before 2000 were hospitalized for it. As many as 6% developed pneumonia and one in a thousand could even develop a post-infectious encephalomyelitis. This means high fevers, altered mental status, seizures, and even focal deficits. A quarter of the patients who did get that measles-associated encephalomyelitis would eventually die because of that disease, with another 33% having severe lifelong disability, blindness, weakness, cognitive impairment, and so on. More rarely, as you might recall from med school, is that complication of subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, a condition which follows the initial viral symptoms by several years. Patients will manifest with intellectual decline, changes in behavior, seizures, and progress rapidly into dementia and eventually coma. It's almost universally fatal, and it progresses over one to three years. Thankfully, SSPE is rare, and according to published epidemiologic data, it may affect about 5 to 10 out of every 100,000 patients with measles. But let's put it into a different context for you and consider the outbreak in Portland from this year. But for us, it's a calm start here in Portland. We are seeing clear skies and a nice sunrise here. The outbreak grew from one patient to 60 in just one month's time, and none of those infected were previously vaccinated. Experts here warn the public might have been exposed at a recent Portland Trailblazers game at Portland's airport, at area schools, a local Costco, and IKEA. Washington State has been called up. What I'd like to do next is extrapolate upon these numbers a bit these 60 patients who acquired measles. Portland's home to maybe 650,000 people who welcome about 45,000 newborns every year. 8% of Portland infants are completely unvaccinated and probably even more don't receive that second dose of the MMR. So let's say 12% aren't fully immunized, 5,000 newborns. Eric and I talked about these numbers. So let's say 12% aren't fully immunized. That would be about 5,000 of the 45,000 born that year. Again, we're just talking about the city of Portland. We can't say that all 100% of them are going to contract it when we know that the infection rate is 90%. 
A 90% infection rate is what we know based on data, according to the Centers for Disease Control. But just to make the math easier, let's say that all 5,000 of them do get the measles. So that would mean that about 1,000 children would end up being hospitalized every year. And to handle this volume, Eric and I quickly looked up on Google Maps. There are three major children's hospitals covering the city of Portland. So roughly about 300 kids per hospital, or 25 admissions per month. Again, this is just a worst-case scenario. And we're only talking about newborns. 300 of these kids might have a severe pneumonia. Because that's what 6% of patients have historically developed due to measles. And 50 would develop encephalomyelitis. That previously mentioned 0.1 to 1% risk. And that's not to mention the fact that the other 40,000 newborns from that year are still at risk. These are the 40,000 other newborns who have zero immune system and would be freakishly vulnerable to all those infected infants around them because these 40,000 would not have been able to receive their first MMR vaccine until 12 to 15 months. And then we've got all those other people out there who are immunocompromised and they can't even get vaccinated for health reasons, not personal ones. Fact or fiction. If you're infected with measles, you can transmit the virus for up to four days before you develop a rash. This next statement is also a fact. The truth is, patients are often most infectious during those three days before the rash appears. Usually, this is when cough and fevers, sore throat, headaches, and other nonspecific symptoms begin. It's in those four days when they're, they have a fever, they're not feeling well, right? All these are common cold symptoms that a parent would, any caregiver, parent, teacher, daycare provider would struggle with identifying as, oh, this is measles versus this is just the sniffles. There's also been plenty of good data showing that you don't even need direct contact with an infected person, that the virus can survive outside of its host for several hours. The highly contagious virus can live on surfaces or in the air for up to two hours. For a virus that's, to be perfectly honest, incredibly rare in the U.S., even with all this hype in the media about it, nobody's going to panic about that kid with a runny nose or a low-grade fever. They're probably not going to pay much attention to them until that fever really picks up. And then it's too late. It's just that these symptoms are hard to discern from the common cold. So fact or fiction? A person infected with measles can infect up to 50% of those around them if they are unvaccinated. I'm afraid that we gave this one away earlier in the show. This is a fictional statement. The risk of transmitting the virus from one person to another is not 50%. It's actually a 90% risk of transmission if you're unvaccinated. You heard Erica right. 9-0%. That's a 9 out of 10 chance if you come into physical contact with somebody who's shedding the virus that you will become infected yourself. Put another way, some virologists use the r naught to describe the transmissibility of a virus. This is an estimate of the number of persons a single person could eventually infect. Flu, for instance, has an r naught of 2 to 3, which is pretty bad. Smallpox, even worse, r naught of 5 to 7. Measles has one of the highest known r naughts between 9 and 18, meaning an infected person has the potential to infect as many as a dozen others. It's also about when you get it, right? Because if you're a baby, an infant, and you get the measles, that's really, really bad in terms of your ability to cope with the illness as opposed to a a 20-year-old who catches the measles. Those are two very distinct individuals. And if you happen to be immunocompromised, you are orders of magnitude more likely to die from the infection. In HIV patients, fatality rates with measles are as high as 40%, and among cancer patients, it can be as high as 70%. Or if you're just a healthy, middle-aged woman who happens to be pregnant and unvaccinated, you run the risk of miscarriage or premature delivery. Fact or fiction? The vaccine used to prevent measles can cause autism and or bowel disease. For 14 years that MMR vaccine is causally associated with autism. And And not just that the MMR vaccine causes autism. That was Andrew Wakefield, by the way. But that our own government, the U.S. government, is covering it up. Claims that the CDC, America's Centers for Disease Control, manipulated and hid data that proves that there is a link between vaccines and autism. 
This is total fiction. I can't believe we're really still having this conversation nowadays, but it hits on so many important points. The influence of social media, the relevance of financial disclosures and conflicts of interest when publishing clinical research, the limitations of multiple hypothesis testing, and all of them have converged into this single horrifying misunderstanding that autism is related to vaccines. So quickly to review the facts here for you, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, the connection between the MMR vaccine and autism, as well as bowel disease, it stems from that 1998 Lancet paper published by Andrew Wakefield, in which he and his co-authors reported 12 patients in the UK who experienced developmental regression and autistic features following the MMR vaccine. When, when families express their concern about um, vaccines causing autism, we know the paper that they're referencing. This was wholly fraudulent work. Wakefield had already committed himself to discrediting the company that produced the MMR vaccine as he himself was trying to patent his own vaccine. And furthermore, he was hired by lawyers to represent some of the patients he even wrote about. It was likely a combination of these conflicts of interest that drove him to publish the work. But that still doesn't give him permission to falsify the data, which is exactly what he did for all the patients. None of the patients had any bowel disease, as the authors claimed, after we had independent investigators adjudicate that histopathology. Some of the patients didn't even have autism. And those who had cognitive impairment had symptoms that predated the MMR. And just to give credit to the work of others here, many have tried to replicate Wakefield's data. And to this day, we still have no evidence to support these accusations. That the findings of that study have been completely disproven by multiple subsequent studies. Then there's this added pressure that's put on our credible scientific officials by hoaxers out there that the CDC is lying to us about this association. And they have covered it up. Which is also completely unfounded. This gets into some of the issues that are inherent to selection bias and the limitations of multiple hypothesis testing. What hoaxers believe the CDC to have covered up is a finding that African American children who received the second dose of the MMR earlier in their childhood, these kids were three and a half times more likely to develop autism. Bear in mind, this is, quote, a statistically significant finding. And it's true, this was a statistically significant finding. But I can talk all day about statistical significance. If you were to look at four subgroups of ethnicity, Caucasian, African American, Asian, and Hispanic, all independently, and then divide each subgroup into five age ranges, 12 to 18 months, 18 to 24 months, and so on, or five regions in the U.S., all independently, the odds are one of these subgroups may have an independent association with autism. With more than 20 random comparisons being made, you are bound to find a spurious association due to chance alone. Diehard statisticians will tell you this means nothing. I might be a little more lenient and say it's hard to know what these spurious associations mean, but I'll concede that there is zero biologic plausibility that African-American children who receive this vaccine at a younger age are more likely to develop autism. Factor Fiction Nothing all that bad really happened after Andrew Wakefield published his paper linking vaccines to autism. Fiction. And you and I talked about this before we started to record the show, because it wasn't exactly all attributed to Andrew Wakefield's paper that people changed their opinions and families decided not to take the vaccines. But certainly the publication of this paper really shook the medical community. And if it took 12 years before Lancet redacted the article... You know, that was 12 years of science being promoted in the community. Yeah, no, it. there are various reasons why families may not want to vaccinate their children. Um, one reason that is stated um, is autism, and it's probably because of this paper that they, they have brought up this concern. We had what? What I'll also say here is that while it's only been nine years since the Wakefield paper was retracted for vaccine rates in the UK to climb back to normal, there have been over 12,000 cases of measles in the UK alone, hundreds of hospitalizations, and at least three known deaths. And that's just in the UK. As I said before, measles kills 100,000 people every year. But if you imagine the impact this paper had on the UK, the proportion of vaccinated children in the UK fell from 92% in 1998 to 78% in 2005. If we think about how this has affected our own country, the United States, between January and May of 2019, there have already been more than 760 cases of measles. real concern over measles, and tonight a public health emergency has now been declared in Washington state. And authorities. And 760 may seem kind of like a small number, 
but it's more than double the 372 that was reported by the CDC for all of 2018. And even that number had tripled the number of cases in the prior year. The number of measles infections has tripled just since last year, David. And So we eliminated in the United States measles in 2000, the year 2000. Right? And now we had, what, 760 cases, right, in this year alone, which is wild. New York State has registered 184 measles cases in just the past four months. Now we are seeing the highest rate of measles this country has seen since it was declared eliminated from the U.S. in the year 2000. Absolutely wild. It was a disease that was not in the United States. Factor fiction. Even years after the retraction of Wakefield's paper, Donald Trump still believes vaccines cause autism. We'll give you a second on this. Yes, this is a fact. Oh yeah, it's a fact. 5.35 a.m., March 24th, 2014, Trump tweets. Healthy young child goes to doctor, gets pumped with massive shot of many vaccines, doesn't feel good, and changes. Autism. That's in all caps. Many such cases, exclamation point. I've put a link to this tweet in the show notes this week, just in case you want to verify it. The thread following Trump's tweet is as hilarious as it is alarming. And the fact that some people can get so many likes and retweets for posting sheer garbage is disturbing. You know, I, I couldn't, didn't believe it myself. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the problem when... Well, I, you know, I think that when a public figure makes a statement like that, the concern is that many people will find that credible, and understandably so, right? If, if, a pub, if a significant public figure like the president makes a scientific statement, and if the president is making that statement, then many people are going to believe them because we believe that he or she, yeah, that he is getting their information from reliable sources and that it's been filtered and vetted. And so it would make sense why a lot of people would, would trust what they would say. But when it's erroneous like that, that causes a significant amount of harm to the community. And I think that it really is the onus of the public figure to, to make sure that the information that they're disseminating is accurate. Yeah, because nobody goes back and fact checks Twitter. You know, people are looking at Twitter for immediate information and they just absorb whatever's out there. It's a very passive acquisition of data. Not a lot of people are actively criticizing or giving feedback to those kinds of things. All right, last statement. Erica, what do you got? Fact or fiction? Vaccines cause harm. A clever person can argue that nothing in this world is perfectly safe. Not fresh vegetables, not airbags, not even oxygen. The question is, as I'm sure you know, does the benefit outweigh the risk? Vaccines, like all other medical interventions, have adverse side effects. So overall, the benefits of a vaccine are greater than the risks. But are there risks? Definitely. So in a sense, vaccines are not perfectly benign. Well, what are the risks then, you might ask? For the MMR, here's what we know. The vaccine can cause a fever in 5 to 15% of patients, a rash in 5%, and then in fewer than 1%, they can have an anaphylactic reaction, which is a severe adverse event. And then in fewer than 1% of patients, we do see more serious risks that are worth mentioning. And although I'm still in full support of our current vaccination program, I would say that we do a poor job of at least completely informing our patients about the risks of these treatments. So here are the concerning risks. According to the Institute on Medicine, the MMR has been associated with anaphylaxis in patients who are allergic to its components. No surprise there. The MMR increases the risk of encephalitis in immunocompromised patients, and the MMR can cause febrile seizures, which is practically never a chronic problem, nor does it typically lead to any long-term disability. So if you'd prefer not to get your seizures from the MMR vaccine, and you'd rather have seizures from measles and encephalitis, then you can be my guest. All this being said, what are we left with? How about I ask you this question? 
So what can we do to correct this problem? Well, I think it's important to talk about it, to talk about it as healthcare providers, reassure families, ask them what their concerns are. Because again, not everyone's concerns about the MMR vaccine is about autism. But if it is about autism, then we can say that we have the science to show that the MMR vaccine does not cause autism. And that's really important for families to know. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. We, we are advocates for our patients and for science and empirical medicine. And what we say matters. And I would say it matters as much, if not more, than our political leaders or other people who carry more social media support. I think that our voices need to be heard just as much as theirs do. Full disclosure, Sophia Joan is 100% up to date with her vaccines. Have no doubt that we are actively trying to educate those anti-vaxxers out there. And you should too. I mean, as physicians, we've all taken an oath to do what we can to improve the health of our patients. That being said, our practice of medicine is not without fault. Medicines are basically toxins whose side effects we've leveraged to treat health concerns. And that's the focus of our third and final segment in Best of 2019, How Medical Care Goes Wrong, The Neurologic Consequences of Organ Transplantation, featuring Dr. Raja Dar, neurointensivist from Washington University at St. Louis. Here it is. I first started the interview curious how Dr. Dar, who's published on some of the various neurologic complications of transplantation, what was it that initially drew him to the field? You've written a lot about this, and what was it that got you interested in the topic? Well, it was actually, as, at first, as a resident in neurology, I was always drawn to the sickest and uh, most medically complex patients. And, of course, that's the reason I chose neurocritical care as a career. And so training in neurology in Canada at a large transplant center, I happened to get a fair bit of experience consulting on transplant patients who had neurological issues. And through collaboration with our transplant surgeons, my first research project as a young resident was looking at the incidence of these neurological complications after liver transplant in particular. And so... I pulled the paper he wrote on this, published in Neurocritical Care in 2008, a single-center study examining these post-operative neurologic complications. And the strongest predictor of neurologic morbidity within 30 days was uncontrolled preoperative hepatic encephalopathy. It was really a nice example of the complex milieu of how systemic changes can affect the brain, whether it be with seizures. Not surprisingly, from his 101 patient cohort, 31% of patients had some sort of neurologic complication following transplantation, one out of every three patients. The most common complication was encephalopathy, again, which was strongly tied to preoperative hepatic encephalopathy. And this was seen in almost every patient who had a complication. But drug toxicity was also common, accounting for 39% of the neurologic complications after liver transplant. Yeah, I think it's something that we're going to see as neurologists most commonly, although not exclusively, in the post-operative period after a transplant. Like I think we mentioned in the previous show with Dr. Zhou, the majority of transplant complications occurred soon after surgery. One other thing is that the incidence of complications may have also gone down over time as they've become more recognized as complications of the transplant and drug-related interactions that are going on in that period. The Incidents of complications later are much less. You, you're going to see those patients sporadically come back to see a neurologist or be admitted with a neurological problem in the weeks to months afterwards. I think both are relevant and interesting. Probably more upfront is what we see. But in my research and reading, there's definitely a, a growing amount of delayed complications, especially as transplant patients are living much longer than they used to. In fact, neurological complications are, in that respect, maybe becoming more common in the delayed period. Yeah. And before we get to those... Neurologic- Here, I'll jump in and say that the neurologic manifestations of transplant complications can be broken down into two groups, 
anyone who's worked in a hospital can attest to this. First, there can be primarily neurologic problems. The issue at hand is a problem in the brain. And second, there could be systemic problems that manifest with neurologic dysfunction, like the organ graft is failing. And teasing these yeah, two I apart can be very difficult early on. Groups, and that is probably the first dichotomy is whether the organ is working or not. Meaning transplant rejection. Thankfully, that's relatively rare. In my experience, that accounts for the minority of neurological complications. And usually those are pretty easy to recognize on routine laboratory tests. And often these people are pretty sick to begin with, and they're already in the ICU. Uh, it's probably, in my experience, more the patient who is otherwise doing well where the organ is working, but then develops complications that poses more of the challenge for the neurologist. And this segues nicely into the next tier of your approach to any patient who's had a transplant complication. They've made it through the surgery, no immediate post-operative complications, surgical site infections, hemodynamic instability, strokes, and so on. You know the organ graft is functioning well. And then, after several weeks or maybe a few months, something changes. There's a neurologic event. You think to yourself, it could just be like any neurologic event of its kind. And maybe it's unrelated to the transplant. A seizure, a stroke, peripheral neuropathy. Or maybe is it a consequence of the transplant? And now you have to worry, is it possibly infectious or isn't it? As we discussed with Dr. Joe before. Or is it a medication side effect? How do you conceptualize the various medications that our organ transplant recipients receive and what those medications can do to the nervous system? Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it is to understand the classes that are used. And there seems to be a, a fairly typical pattern, although it does vary by organ. Obviously, all patients receive corticosteroids. Fast-acting immunosuppressants. That's been, you know, around for 50 years or more. And are still drugs fraught with the risk of agitation, tremor, and hyperglycemia in the short term, and opportunistic infections and myopathy over the long term. But the real revolution was the advent of the so-called calcineurin inhibitors. The first one being cyclosporin. And then more recently, tacrolimus. And even more recently, serolimus and everolimus which are actually mTOR inhibitors. So they've got a different side effect profile from TAC, as we'll get into. Those are almost ubiquitously used in addition to steroids, and those form both a revolution for the success of transplants, but also have perhaps the greatest potential for toxicity. Namely, for tacrolimus, we think about action tremor, akinetic mutism, headache, or PRESS, the posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, whose risk increases when there are toxic levels of TAC, or when there's kidney dysfunction, or hypertension, sepsis, or even a combination of these things. And in addition to this class of drugs, there are also cytotoxic drugs, like muronumab, or OKT3. OKT3, which is a, an antibody that can cause headache and aseptic meningitis very commonly. And so we need to be aware of these early agents that can cause patients who are otherwise doing well to have uh, neurological symptoms like headache and even uh, have a meningeal picture. I think it's also easy to conceptualize these complications as being early complications and maybe more delayed complications. So of the solid organ transplant complications that affect the nervous system, how do you kind of categorize these complications by timing uh, from the transplant? I think the, the easiest way is to look at early being Technically, it would probably be anywhere in those 30 days after transplant. And the reason that's helpful is that early period is, is a time of high risk for neurological complications, but also uh, it's a time when specific things like drug toxicity are especially common. And that's largely because, one, you're having more drugs given in that period, including induction agents, but also sometimes loading doses of the calcineurin inhibitors and steroids. So the early period is really a high-risk period. It's a period when drug toxicity is particularly prevalent. And also, of course, the metabolic and organ-related problems tend to happen in that time period where if the graft is not working or there's you know, concomitant renal dysfunction from medications or from hypotension, that can cause encephalopathy, for example. So, so early, period, early period, high risk systemic infections, metabolic derangements, metabolic drug toxicities. Prevalent. While later, beyond 30 days, they're at risk for a different type of complication. Drug toxicity can occur, but it's less common, as are metabolic and graft failure, of course. 
but you have a higher risk for more prolonged consequences of immunosuppression. Like opportunistic CNS infections or CNS malignancies. Are things you would think about in the months to years after transplantation. So in this later phase of transplantation, say a patient comes into your hospital and presents with seizures. Now, when I think about a patient who has their first ever unprovoked seizure of life, usually you don't initiate antiepileptic therapy unless there's something that's more concerning that raises your suspicion that they're going to have more events, like they have a focal lesion or they've got something on the EEG. Now, this is not the same for organ transplant recipients. If they've got a seizure, you've got to be a lot more concerned. So how does the transplant process inform how you would address these patients, how you manage these patients? I, th- I think certainly the the breadth of causes of seizures is is quite extensive and can be intimidating. But I think it still breaks down into the reversible metabolic and drug-related causes of seizures, which again occur more in the early period. And the prognosis is quite good. And in fact, in that case, anti-epileptics beyond that acute period may not be warranted. You treat the underlying cause, and then seizures can be prevented moving forward. However, in the delayed period, as you describe, when a patient comes in after transplant with a seizure, or with really any even nonspecific symptom, uh, you really have to worry about some quite subtle neurological process that may be heralded by the seizure. And the, the most common one of those would be, would be an infection, which can occur even in the absence of a fever. Which we discussed with Dr. Joe previously. But also a number of chronic diseases like a malignancy, lymphoma, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, or PML, which is, of course, related to an infection, but can present with white matter disease. So the types of things that cause seizures are different in that delayed period, and certainly it warrants a very careful workup, including MRI lumbar puncture, to evaluate a patient after a transplant with a seizure. Is your threshold to image and to get EEG, is that lower than your average patient? I think so. I, I think it's fair to say that, especially in that delayed period, you have to have a very low threshold to fully work up any patient with neurological symptoms because the presentations may be attenuated by the immunosuppression. These patients may just look less sick. They could be harboring a massive brain lesion or severe meningitis, and you'll never know it, which is why we always get imaging before the LP in these patients. It's probably not often that I've seen a lumbar puncture done before at least a routine brain imaging, even if it's not an MRI, but a head CT. And their imaging won't be exactly what you expect either. For example, in patients with post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, the confluent enhancement pattern may be less pronounced, or it could be ring-like. Certainly the enhancement pattern in the presence of severe immunosuppression is less conspicuous. Patients with CNS aspergillosis or abscesses may also have less surrounding vasogenic edema, stuff like that. Even if you do image, maybe less uh, obvious, but also things like fever and pleocytosis and all the typical findings of a process that is going on may be more subtle in these kind of patients. So it's really unlikely that a seizure after transplant is benign in that period, and it does really require a thorough workup. In a patient who comes in with a clearly drug-induced neurologic problem, somebody who has NSAID-associated aseptic meningitis, it's easy in those situations to say, okay, we need to discontinue any further use of NSAIDs because it's obviously resulted in this significant neurologic event. But in patients who have you know, cyclosporin or tacrolimus-associated press or other complications, it's not as easy to say you have to stop your immunosuppression, you, know, you, you need it for your organ transplant. What do you do in those situations, kind of in the acute setting, and then how are these patients kind of managed in the long term? When do we, I guess, reinitiate therapy, or when can we move on to alternative therapies? Yeah, the the issue of drug toxicity and what to do about it is, is certainly a, a difficult issue, and, and making sure that you feel confident in the drug toxicity. For example, was that liver transplant patient's subarachnoid hemorrhage related to tacrolimus-associated press? Or was it related to coagulopathy from hepatic insufficiency? And then certainly the acute management involves either discontinuing or holding the medication, or the other thing that has happened I've seen is if clearly the dose was elevated. Maybe the tacrolimus level was twice what was expected. Sometimes if it's a not life-threatening complication, meaning just headaches or tremor, or maybe mild press, if that can be, you know, conceived, 
Then I've seen dose reduction while still continuing the, the offending agent as an option. That That's not all the time. And Meaning this, do you as the physician believe that either the side effect was truly benign and the patient does not find it functionally impairing, or if the side effect were slightly more serious, do you feel confident enough that you can work with the patient to maintain the serum levels in a safe and effective range moving forward? Of course, there are times, and often when we see those patients, it's more severe where they have seizures and more severe press. And in those cases, uh, we would recommend holding the cyclosporin or tacrolimus and then once the syndrome has resolved, which, you know, can take days, but often, you know, a week or more, then your options are uh, threefold. One, if you felt it was due to aggressive dosing to rechallenge at a much more cautious dosing of the same agent. Okay, you restart the drug once levels return to a safe and therapeutic range and monitor closely. I would say that's not so common in my experience, but I think that's one option. One is trying an alternative agent like switching someone from tacrolimus to serolimus, which carries a lower risk of press. And that's what I see happen the most often is simply rechallenging both a different agent once the symptoms have clearly abated. And obviously, you'll be doing this under close monitoring and with the explicit approval of the patient's primary transplant team. Going along that same line, in situations where it's not so clear that a medication is producing a toxic effect, but it is a medication that you do see that's associated with that neurologic consequence. Say somebody's on asparaginase for induction and then they have a venous sinus thrombosis and they have seizures and now they have hemorrhages as a complication of that. But they're also in DIC because they're immediately post-transplant and they're septic. It's hard to draw the line sometimes and say it's that drug or it's not. And you know, how do you go about having that conversation with the organ transplant team and the rest of the ICU team and you know the patient about well, it's not so clear, or it's more clearly going to be this or the other. Yeah, I think you, you mentioned the conversation. And of course, that's the critical component that this is a, a really big team, probably bigger teams than, uh, than we as neurologists are often used to, meaning there's a transplant surgeon, there's often a transplant physician, there's obviously the patient, the family. So definitely that conversation comes in very handy. And obviously, they've been following the patient quite closely, so they're also actually quite helpful to tell you the time course of these symptoms if, if that's in question. I think you obviously have to decide to what degree this medication may be contributing. And I think in the case of calcineurin inhibitors, I found it easier because that's where imaging can be helpful nowadays. With MRI, there's not much else in that metabolic picture, although certainly press can occur from other things. If you see changes that are concerning for press, even if they have sepsis and DIC, which could be contributing, I think you have to assume, given that that's a very high risk medication for that syndrome, that it could at least be largely contributing. You can think about other medications the same way. Mycophenolate mofetil, which is used in kidney transplants, not uncommonly causes or it exacerbates headache and dizziness. But how much of this can we really attribute to the mycophenolate? And how much of this is a consequence of hydration status or comorbid vascular disease? Besides conceptualizing these complications by the timing of onset, or the specific medication classes, or maybe the particular MRI findings that can affect the organ transplant population, you might also think about which disorders are more likely to affect specific populations of transplant recipients. There are specific complications, at least we need to think about, that are unique or certainly more likely with certain transplants. For example, intracranial hypertension. Especially liver transplant recipients. Or immediately after liver transplant, the risk of osmotic demyelination. There's often a large correction of the hyponatremia that cirrhotic patients have. And these fluid shifts can cause myelinolysis. Then there's Wernicke's encephalopathy following gut or liver transplant because of the malnutrition that people with intestinal malabsorption have and then the sudden resumption of intestinal function after transplant. Now these patients are all of a sudden absorbing more carbohydrates and they can rapidly deplete any of the remaining thiamine stores. That's one that's fairly unique to intestinal transplant. Or you can imagine in patients with heart or lung transplant, the chances of having a mass lesion are a little bit higher. In particular, toxoplasmosis following heart transplant, which likes to hide its cysts in the transplanted heart muscle. And of course, anatomical injuries are unique to each transplant. So you can imagine the physical risks of surgery, given the particular region of the body that's involved. Heart and lung transplants tend to have risk of phrenic nerve injury. 
while renal transplants carry a slight increased risk of injury to the femoral nerve or the lumbosacral plexus, and so on. What should our listeners take away from our discussion today? I think the main lesson that I've learned from reviewing patients after transplantation is that we need to be vigilant for neurological complications. They can be subtle from headache, paresthesias, tremor, or they can manifest abruptly with a seizure. But most importantly, we have to recognize which ones are reversible, likely drug toxicities, treatable infections, and work those up appropriately. And so I think that's where I really see the neurologist being critical is being able to take that away to say, appropriately work out this patient and to separate out those reversible causes that are often drug or metabolic from the catastrophic causes. And not only can the neurologist be helpful in working up the complications following organ transplantation, but the fact that many systemic problems manifest with neurologic dysfunction make us as neurologists very useful in the pre-transplant process. As transplant medicine becomes more sophisticated and these patients are living longer and fuller lives, we may be able to contribute to the care of patients awaiting transplant and maybe even guide the transplant team on which patients may be good candidates, despite how neurologically impaired they may seem, especially among patients with liver failure. Some patients who have very severe neurological complications before transplantation as a result of acute liver failure, where often you can get severe cerebral edema a raised intracranial pressure, seizures, and it can be a really life-threatening scenario. What I've seen in some of my experience in my research is that if those patients undergo uh, liver transplantation in that case, I was surprised to see the the really dramatic improvements that they can, they can make. And I, I think it's worth stressing that we shouldn't give up on those patients if we're consulted on them before transplantation, that in fact, those patients, often younger patients, whether it be acetaminophen overdoses, other etiologies, they can really make not only good liver recoveries, but have quite dramatic neurological improvement and often had the lowest incidence in my experience of complications after transplant, even though they were the sickest before transplant. To all the listeners out there, thank you so much for joining us for 2019. And for more great content, please check out the podcast archive on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, or as they say, wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode of the Brainwaves Podcast was produced by myself, Jim Siegler, at a Studio 3 in Philadelphia, with so much amazing support from all the incredible contributors this past year. Regarding the episode this week, I'd like to thank Dr. Raja Darigan from WashU in St. Louis, who helped put together the show on transplant complications. I'd also like to thank my family for their participation in the episode about brain food, Rocky Siegler, my hilariously pragmatic father, Ellen Burnett, my aunt, Joan Dietz, my grandmother, the matriarch of our family, my hugely supportive wife, Erica Mejia, who's been on several shows without whom none of this would have been possible, our wonderful daughter, Sophia Joan, vaccinated and doing just fine, and to all the listeners out there who've made Brainwaves such a success over these past four years. Music for our program was courtesy of Axel Tree, Chris Sabrisky, John Passon, Kevin McLeod, Josh Woodward, Steve Coombs, Lee Rosevere, Scott Holmes, Advent Chamber Orchestra, Cold Noise, and Pachyderm. Sound effects by Mike Kunig and Daniel Simeone. I'm Jim Sigler for Brainwaves, and I'll talk to you again in 2020.